going to try to conduct to uh, create such an environmental history. I think it's going to be pretty valuable to have those sorts of details there from, from these observers. That's especially true because northern Arizona is such a big, diverse region. And there's just inherent value in hearing about how change has happened in this place versus that place. Because as we all know, it can be dramatically different on this side of the mesa versus that side of the mesa, whether we're talking about one summer as rains, or what happens in the winter, or erosion, or what happens through longer, um, longer climate cycles. So to me, there's important data in here. And people in the future can go through it and pull some of that data out. But what, what's also important to me to point out is that it would be really narrow-minded to look at this collection as only a collection of facts. It's not quite like the records of temperature or precipitation that you might find through the weather service where you have lists of numbers. Quite a few of these narratives contain elements that don't quite fit into our understanding of the scientific record. And um, just as an example of that, shortly after this, in the same interview, Rose Gishi here was talking about the mandatory livestock production that took place um, in many places in the country in the 30s, but really heavily on the, uh, the Navajo Nation where many sheep were slaughtered. And she believes that since then, as you heard, the family's wash has dried up. But why has that happened? Well, according to her, it has happened because of changing grazing practices, which is plausible scientifically. But she says it's happened because the livestock numbers have been reduced. What did she say? She said that her grandfather told her, you'll get more rain if you have more stock. And to me, that sounds suspiciously close to the uh, sort of pioneers mantra back in the uh, 19th century that rain follows the plow and so let's go and settle western Nebraska and eastern Colorado and west Texas and all these places where the same kind of settlement that people had been practicing further east just wasn't going to work well and in fact rain was not going to follow those plows. So that take is really diametrically opposed to most scientific understanding which says well if you have a whole lot of grazing you're going to remove the plant cover and the uh, moisture may not soak into the ground quite as much, and you might you have more erosion and lower water tables rather than higher water tables. So, scientifically speaking, there are some questions about this. And I have two reactions to this. The first is that oral history is never going to be just a collection of facts, as I, as I mentioned. It's filtered, it's observation, and it can be close observation. But it's going to be filtered through memory and desire and nostalgia and all the kind of things that cloud our own understanding of just our own past. It's, and you all know what I'm talking about there. So it's a very human look at the physical world with all the fallibility that that implies and all the emotion. So as a journalist, here's, here's my take on it. I am obligated to present my understanding of the context for observations like this. So that's why I'm telling you tonight, and why I wrote in the introduction of the book, that I don't agree with Rose Gishi's analysis here of why her stream, why, why the wash dried up. It's the same as if I'm doing a story on climate change. And of course, as you all know, there are people out there who will say either climate change is not happening, or if it is happening, it's not our fault. Or if it is, there's nothing we can do about it anyway. Maybe that last one's true, I don't know. But, um, and so I might quote somebody saying that in a story, I might use that information, but as a journalist, I'm also obligated to point out that the great preponderance of scientific evidence says, uh, no, -uh. it says, it is our fault, actually. That's pretty well agreed upon. So, as a journalist, I have to give that context for things that, whether I, for observations that I agree with or I don't agree with. So, as a journalist and as an oral historian, I'm also obliged to present that analysis to the future. I think that's an important role. And I do so with the conviction that somebody in the future is going to find this useful. And they're going to find useful both the observation, the close observation that she did make, and the interpretation that she has of that observation, even though we may all disagree with her interpretation of that. And then people in the future are going to be asking questions we haven't even thought of. So I think it's pretty important to get that, just to deliver that material to the, to the future. Let me give you another example of how oral history can kind of play with your expectations, which is something I, I love when I see that this happening with the students. Um, Catherine Smith here is a um, Diné elder in Navajo who lives up by Big Mountain. And here's an excerpt from 
the interview with her that you'll hear is in her native language. So here's what she's saying. She's saying something like, um, the juniper tree is the man. The pinion pine is a woman. This is how it was said when they were explained. Now that all of us women have put ourselves inside genes, the forests are being overtaken by new juniper growth. Perhaps that is why. So, it's kind of funny, right? It's because women are wearing pants today that we're seeing this vegetation change. Right? In many places, the juniper's are doing great and pinion pines are not doing so great. It's not the scientific explanation that I've heard. Um, another example, Ben, ben Kityavit, whose uh, photo you saw on the, the website earlier, is a, um, is a Paiute elder, Kaibab, Kaibab Paiute elder, who lives on the uh, Arizona Strip, and he works as a Park Service Ranger up at Pipe Spring National Monument there by the Utah border. Um, and I mentioned those, those details because I need those to kind of fix him on the map the way I do all these narrators. But from talking to him, I gather that the geography that he sees on the landscape is wholly different from what I see with those state lines and county lines and all that that kind of stuff, and the difference between the Park Service and the reservation and BLM. So he was telling me about his family background in, in that border area, and how, of course, the, the Paiutes roamed widely because they were living in this very arid landscape with really widespread uh, dispersed food sources and, of course, really dispersed water sources, so you had to have a big sort of home range, right? Um, and so he told me that his, his grandfather, who was a very traditional Paiute, was able to communicate through telepathy with family members, so this, with people close to him, up to a distance of about 200 miles. That was his range, Ben said. And Ben said that further back, some of his people had actually trans, um, practiced teleportation. That was something that was possible back in the old days. But people today have lost these skills. And here's what he said. Because we eat too much, we lose our spirituality. We lose our realm of spirituality by eating a lot. In the old times, they were more or less on the verge of starvation, and they maintained that spiritual realm continuously during that time. It's very hard to do that today. So that was his take on some of his family and tribal history. And I should point out that Ben is also the, the guy who told me that um, he had seen John Wesley Powell's ghost at Pipe Spring National Monument because he was doing interpreta uh, interpretation there. As, park rangers will do, and he was telling visitors, well, John Wesley Powell stayed here in this building when he came through here, and he started seeing this ghost. John Wesley Powell's ghost is kind of distinctive because of course, his one arm. Um, and he realized this message that there's, there's a reason for this, and it turned out that the reason was he was telling the story wrong. He was getting the story wrong. John Wesley Powell had stayed in a different building, not that one that he had been talking about. Um, so John Wesley Powell had come back to correct the Park Service interpretation, right? It's good service. Um, so, so all these stories are kind of funny, and they're kind of intriguing, and they're kind of way out there. You know, ghosts, and telepathy, and transportation, the connection between fashion, clothing, and vegetation that's out there on the ground. Um, for me, it's hard to think of the, these sorts of stories in the same realm as data, right? Um, and so that, that's a, that stretches my mind. And what I have to do with that is to um, do what I, well, I have to do this a lot, which is listen to the advice that I give my journalism students, that I should probably follow myself, um, which is that if you're not surprising yourself by what you hear when you interview somebody, you're not trying hard enough. Some of you might know the journalist uh, Mark Bowden. He's the guy who wrote the, um, the account um, called Black Hawk Down, which uh, the story about um, American troops in Somalia, and that became a, a movie. So he's a, he's a well-known um, journalist, practitioner of narrative nonfiction. And so he, he wrote this a couple years ago. <clears throat> Every reporter knows the sensation of having a story, quote, ruined 
by some new and surprising piece of information.